Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. Well, it's my great pleasure this evening to have a chat with Susan Blackmore, who I think I've said in the past is one of the clearest thinking people I know, but that may be just bias because uh, we happen to agree on most points. I'm <clears> sure we'll uh, find something to disagree about. <laughs> <laughs> but good evening, Sue. Um, the uh, a lot of different areas that uh, you've worked in, and uh, let's look at some of them. I think one of the most important ideas in which you've said is uh, maybe the most important that has ever been discovered is is evolution by natural selection. Um, it is remarkable that all the wonders that we see in life has come about by this completely undirected uh, process. Um, some people think it, it isn't true, but um, most people are convinced by it now. Uh, do you feel that the proof of it is, is, is there? It's not a question of proof. It's interesting hearing you put it that way because I, people say, I don't believe in evolution or you know, creationism, obviously true and so on. What's required is people to understand it. Once you understand it, you can't not believe it. At least I don't think so. I, I'll tell you a story. I was um, in a, one of those terrible queues in, at LA airport or some such place get, going into the States. And it was really, really tedious. And I just got chatting to the man in front of me. He turned out to be a Southern Baptist pastor. And so we got into an argument about evolution. And I started and I said to him, but look, just imagine, I think I had my, I think the only thing I have is my passport. This will do for my passport. It's not very convincing, but okay. You know, and I said to him, look, just imagine it could be anything at all. Let's take this. Now, just imagine that 10 copies are made of this passport and they're a bit different, different color uh, covers, different number of pages, whatever. And then they're let loose in the world. And some of them succeed better than others. And most of them are hopeless. And the one that succeeds is copied again, uh, 10 times and then put into the world to see which succeeds best. Now, what's going to happen? Well, passports are going to get better, aren't they? Because they're adapting to the circumstances they're in. And he got it. And it was one of those moments, that's why I'm telling the story, because I was like, yes, he got it. And you could see the look on his face. Oh, that's how evolution works. It's a perfectly straightforward natural process copy something many times, throw away most of the copies because they don't work, copy the successful one, do it again, do it again. Design for function appears out of nowhere. Now, once you see that, how can you possibly not believe in evolution? Um, so yes, lots of people in, in the States, I read recently uh, something like um, over 10% of biology teachers in the states the 13 percent it was are convinced by creationism and a further 50 percent are not sure whether creationism is true or evolution is true now imagine you go to school and, and nobody really explains it to you no wonder americans are so um not believing in evolution so you asked the question is it proved you don't prove it um there's so much evidence that's overwhelming. <laughs> we now can look back on the uh, human genomes and see how we came out of Africa, how different things divided up, what our relationships are to the Neanderthals. So all this you can tell because, because we know about evolution, but it's not about proof. Yes, not proof, but you can, you can almost settle the question by armchair logic, but then there is such a massive experimental evidence as well. Yes, but it's not so evidence that says, I've now proved evolution. It's just the building up and building up and building up of it's got to be true. I suppose I'm kind of balking at the idea of proof in science because you don't. Yes, well, it's never a total proof, of course. No, I mean, you prove I mean... mathematical things, but 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 in, in science, it's about mm. evidence building up and evidence rejecting some things and other things carry on. So there's never an ultimate proof. But I mean, <laughs> it would be staggering to think of something that could disprove. In principle, it could be disproved. You know, if we found a, um, a, a an iPhone in um, a Tutankhamun's uh, coffin or something, you know, um, that would disprove it. But, you know, it's ridiculous things like that. Yes. Now, your, your best known book, I think, is probably The Meme Machine. 
And the, the idea of the meme also follows from evolution by natural selection, but uh, with a completely different replicator. Yeah. Well, that example I gave with the passport, I mean, passports are a meme, really. I mean, passport, that having a passport is an idea. It, let, let's go back to basics. Dawkins' idea of what a meme is from his 1976 amazingly best-selling book, The Selfish Gene, was, as you have just mentioned, that cultural items, um, all the things we pass from person to person, we imitate from person to person, are a replicator in the same sense that genes are. So the machinery that copies genes is chemistry and so on. The <clears throat> machinery that copies memes is human beings. So um, that passport is a conglomeration of memes because it's been copied and copied and copied until passports get more effective and people you know, use, use them all the time. So that, that's the basic I idea behind memetics. And I, you know, you said about my book, Meme Machine. Well, um, back in 1998, seven, yeah, 1996, seven, I was terribly ill with uh, chronic fatigue and I was lying in bed for ages, <laughs> staring at the ceiling. I could only read for about 10 minutes at a time before I was so exhausted I couldn't do anything. And I very, very slowly read uh, uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea by Dan Dennett, which is lots about memes. And that made me go back and read Selfish Gene again. And from there, I just thought, obviously, just look around. I mean, look here, you see all those paintings behind there? Well, they're copied. <laughs> I mean, I painted them, but now they appear on this Zoom. They copied all over the place. Um, and, um, you know, or look at chairs, look at carpet, anything you can see here, clothes. Look at Don, that thing you've got, that. I don't know what that squiggle on your jumper is, but you know, it, these are all things copied in, in culture. And it's so obvious when you start thinking about everything in culture as being copied and competing to use us to keep it there or to copy it on, then to me, that's what memetics is all about and why I find it so exciting and, and wonderful. And then most people think it's rubbish. So, you know, fair enough, I don't. <laughs> But of course, memes are a human thing. Animals copy each other to some extent, but not much. Since, since no, we have not much, they do not. We have speech, and and later means like writing and and iPhones and so on. Um, we we really are the species that is affected by memes. So we have this phenomenon of uh, two replicating species, which are intermingling and not necessarily working in each other's interest. No, oh, good point. Um, in fact, they're both competing and cooperating. So um, one of the important things about the concept of a replicator is that they're selfish, uh, as in a selfish gene. Now, of course, this can be easily misunderstood, but it's, um, <laughs> it's silly to misunderstand it because they can't be selfish in the sense that we talk about a selfish person. I mean, a gene is a bit of information on, on you know, an order of basis on, on a molecule of DNA, or at least that's what gives rise to the, to the genes. They can only be selfish in the sense that they will be copied whenever and however they can without regard to the consequences because they're just chemistry. They don't care about us. The same can be said of memes, selfish memes. Memes are strings of information, chunks of information, you know, books, stories, the whole concept of Zoom, whatever it is. Um, they will use our brains and our bodies and our mouths and, and our hands to write things whenever and however they can without regard for the consequences. That's what's meant by selfish replicators. So genes are selfish. They will get replicated and produce new animals, plants and everything whenever they can. Memes are selfish, they will produce new books, whatever, whenever they can, and they don't care about the consequences. They don't care about the consequences for us, for our genes, for the planet, for everybody else, because they can't. They're just information. I mean, they're, they're both genes and memes are basically just information. So you can see the interplay between genes and memes. Uh, in cultural evolution theory, this is called gene culture coevolution. In the meme machine, I called it mimetic drive it, because I was talking about how the memes drive our brains over evolution to get bigger and bigger, to hold more memes, um, and how they've driven um, various things that we do. So I, I mean, we have a different 
rather different view on things because the cultural evolution people on the whole don't think memes are replicators and I do and Dawkins and Dennett do but not very many other people but that's the gist they're competing replicators and we humans are the only really effective meme machines on this planet other animals imitate to a small extent but as you pointed out they don't have language which is the main conveyor of information yeah. between us Yes, one of the memes which uh, has been questioned as being not too useful for humans is uh, is religion. And um, Richard Dawkins, at a, in a recent lecture in the USA, he was asked by a questioner who said, uh, yes, of course, religion is false, but don't you think that there, it has some good effects? What did he say? He gave a one word answer. No, no. Mm, I wouldn't give that answer. Um, I think the, the reason that religions have proved so persistent and so difficult to get rid of is because of the advantages they supply. So if you imagine a kind of continuum like this, with at this end is religions are completely dreadful and hopeless and bad for us, and at this end they're wonderful and absolutely marvellous for us, Dawkins is here, and I'm kind of here, because I don't think they would have succeeded uh, for so long and stay with us if they didn't have some payoff and this is the this is the thing we have to work with if we believe as i do that on the whole religions are an absolute disaster for individuals not so much because some individuals can benefit from them but for societies in general and for the planet certainly they are really bad i think it's better to accept that the reason they keep going is because of the the, the good things they provide so for example Perhaps an extreme example um, is in Catholicism. Um, <clears throat> God, I've forgotten what it's called now. When you conf a confession, you, there's there's a great urge in us to, you know, I've done something bad and I don't know what to do about it and I feel awful and I can't tell anybody. And I'll go to the priest and I'll confess it and it'll be all, all right as long as I do ten hell marys or whatever you have to do. Now, that is a kind of, you know. A, a payoff if you like that helps people what about going into a beautiful mosque or cathedral or um any religious building that's just full of beautiful things and wonderful music and it uplifts your heart you know that's you know then there's all the probably the most things i mean loads and loads and loads of studies that some show uh that individuals in certain societies are the religious ones are, are, are somewhat happier but it looks like very, there's a lot of research and it's quite complicated, but generally it looks like the main reason for that is the social bonding that it provides. So, you know, you're in the same religion with these people. You go to this church and the other people go to that, you know, mosque or whatever it might be, or they go to a different do denomination of church or whatever it is. But you get you get your group, your your insiders, your friends. You see them every Friday or Sunday or, or whatever it is. Um, and that provides a lot of um, uh, help to certain people. I think if it weren't for those kinds of limited benefits, then religions would just be thrown out because obviously that, you know, obviously there isn't a God and there are prayers don't work and so on. Um, but that's the balance, I think, that the religions have struck. And the mimetic way to look at why we've got these appalling religions now is to think not this is Christianity, this is, is Judaism, this is Islam. I'm talking about the, the monotheistic faith here. You know, if you think that's how they always were, it's, it's not true. It's much more like think about Darwin's tree of, or bush of life and think about how each of these religions began. And then there were all these different offshoots and you can draw it there, you know, you look online for, <laughs> for tree, trees of um, the evolution of religions and they're amazingly, you know, all these different sects and that's just the same kind of evolutionary process as you get if you look into the evolution of worms or mushrooms or anything else. And so it's helpful then to think why have these particular versions survived? Because they just pay off enough that people are willing to believe complete rubbish and devote their lives to pointless, pointless activity. We, we, Sorry, we, I get a bit carried away on that question. We did discuss a, a little while ago the idea that maybe religions could have domesticated us in in the same sense that we domesticate animals by 
doing artificial selection to make them more uh, useful to us. Um, religion certainly in the past must have been in a situation where people reproduce better if they conform to the religion. And um, it's a frightening thought, isn't it? it uh, yeah, yes. Uh, there's a lot of different frightening threads to that, that one. Um, I think it looks to me that, and there's lots and lots of research on this, which I'm not a great expert on, but anthropological research and so on. It seems to build up to the view that that's how religion started. So early religions um, would have been um, local, local gods, lo local religions. You know, you had this spirit of, of this tree or this spirit of this fat, um, waterfall or this whatever and different gods doing different things i mean things of pantheon and of, of roman gods and so on um and the monotheistic ones came along and crashed a whole lot of others and took over um now did they domesticate us well it, it in though in in the way that they evolved they re needed to help people to reproduce more so by uh, providing um, social cohesion, groups that had a religion where everybody um, agreed to the same thing, did the same rituals and agreed with each other uh, about whatever God it was, would have had more social coherence and those would have been um, uh, survived better and would have pro pr produced more genes. But there's also this kind of, I'm going to use the word sinister, but I don't quite think that's quite right. But think about our basic biology sex differences now we live in an era where it's kind of not cool to talk about sex differences because after all we can all be trans and we can you know and and really are we different now i'm absolutely up for you know equality of opportunity for women and men let's you know we can do the same things we've got brains too but underlying that are some basic biological facts that for men to pass on their genes, the best way is to have sex with as many people as you possibly can. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, if you pick uh, beautiful, uh, intelligent women, then they're, they're, their children are more likely to succeed. But on the whole, just the more, you know, the more sperm you spread, the better. But for women, and this is true of, of all mammals and many other species, too. Um, but for women in human women, some have had huge numbers, but basically you're restricted to sort of six to 10 children uh, in the modern era, more like two, three, four. You have to put all your effort into making sure that those children grow up and are able to pass on the genes in their turn. In other words, you don't want to go around promiscuously getting sperm from anywhere. You want to choose either a man who's going to look after those children really well and provide resources for them and you, or one who's going to provide um, uh, sexy sons who will be <laughs> more likely to spread genes in the next generation, um, or both. And there's quite a lot of evidence. There are some people who will, you know, mate with marry a, a really good provider and then get some genes from somewhere else. Uh, not unheard of. But these biological factors, I'm coming back to religion. See how religions allow men to control women, which is basically what they want to do. They want, you know, it, it helps them to get some women, control her, have sex, lots of other places, but this one keep so that you know that those are your children. A woman will almost always know that her children are hers because she gave birth to them, but a man won't. So he has to protect his woman. So if you look at Islam in particular, the Quran is absolutely chock full of stuff that comes out of that basic biology, you know, keep the women at home, cover them up, they're yours, you own them, they're objects, they're chattel, um, that's, that's how it plays out there. Makes perfect sense in biology. Now, what I'm coming around to is that we're gradually getting away from that, but it's hard because these religions are so dug in. But we are, I, I think, and I hope, breaking away from that so that we have memes that now are more advantageous to we human beings as people rather than just for the genes, which is how they started out. So this is a slightly optimistic view that we can break away from that, that male dominated women are constrained view um, and, and have a better future. 
a slightly, I have to mention the fact that um, religious people have more children. And there's lots of evidence now. Um, Muslims tend to have more than Christians, but Christians, the more, the more um, uh, devout they are, the more children they tend to have because Jesus thinks it's great to have lots of children. I don't expect he really thought that, but who knows? Seemed like a nice guy to me. Uh, <laughs> and I wonder what he'd say now about abortion. I, you know, I like to think that Jesus, if he knew that it was possible to have a little pill that aborted a baby that really was not going to be brought up happily and was ever wanted, he might go along with it i don't know but the simple fact is that religious people are um you can look at you know the most devout of kind of like orthodox jews are having something like eight children per woman and atheists are 1.5 under, under replacement now some people say oh god the world's going to be overwhelmed and you know and atheists are going to die out but we won't because there are plenty of religious people who who convert to atheism or just give up but, you know but there's a lot you 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 sounded kind of scared and worried there there's some scary thoughts if you want to be scared by them but could we perhaps argue that uh, a willingness to to believe in religion uh it would be if that could arise genetically it would be an adaptive mutation uh, i i can't imagine you could have a, 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 a mutation that would make you believe in, in any particular thing it's more to my mind that the religions evolved to exploit the way we are and they are very very clever at this co-evolution and so they exploit our tendency to be a hierarchical species. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a bit like the other great apes, you know, where there's a king, you know, the silverback and what have you. And we defer to the top man uh, or the top woman, Liz Truss, um, whoever it might be. Um, we tend to, to work in this kind of hierarchical way, hierarchical way. men do <clears> it more so than women, but... Uh, that we do, that we follow these biological things I was talking about in terms of the way, the different things that benefit men versus women. The fact that we love things that stir our emotions in certain ways, you know, music and poetry and singing together, or singing together when your, your breathing comes together and even your heart rates start to come together with everybody else's. I mean, all of these things are what the religions exploit. I think, it, I can't imagine that it could be, a mutation that would suddenly make you be religious but there could be mutations that would make you more inclined to those factors which allow the religions to exploit mm -hmm. us for their own replication that that's what's important to me the religions are exploiting us whole our brains our bodies our whole way of being for their own benefit as selfish means so the <clears throat> this is a quite an important example of the the genes and the memes interacting yeah. but um these are the two replicators but one could argue that um neither of them are quite aligned with human happiness correct yes and, and well yet, said don <laughs> and absolutely yet, and yet human happiness is a, a mental process which has evolved um presumably to further the interest of the me of the genes so th there's a conundrum there interesting interesting what is happiness i would say that the genes have given us the tendency to think we're happy when we get stuff we think we want so that's what our culture works on endless growth let's have more stuff you know we'll be happy if we ha i mean obviously if we can't pay our electricity bills we're unhappy but it's well known that once you get to a certain level of income happiness doesn't increase it, happiness increases from poverty to a certain level and then it more or less flattens off very rich people are not happier than than you know uh slightly rich people um so um i can't remember now what, what i'm waffling on about what was your question or your point the, i was it was a contrast between happiness which oh. no doubt no doubt evolved to serve the genes yes yes thank but, you thank you for reminding me which reminding actually me. So, under modern conditions it, it hardly does it's in in great conflict with the genes 
for instance, yes. by using, using family planning to achieve greater happiness. Yes, yes, yes. Um, th 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 this is really interesting, um, this point you're making, because neither selfish memes nor selfish genes care about us at all. You know, when I said they're selfish in the sense that they'll be get copied whenever they can without regard for the consequences, one of those major consequences is our happiness. But as you have just pointed out, the genes set us up to get happy when what when we get more food if we were hungry when we get more drink if we were thirsty when we get more things which gives us status um so we're very inclined to want status the way men want status is set up a bit differently biologically although it's changing now than, than women are but status is is very important and we try to get that we try to get famous and hope people will read our books or you know follow our twitters or I, I don't do twitter but you know all those kinds of things so we're set up to grasp things to want things and then we find that actually that's not what makes us happy and i get upset by the the, the, the way that politics goes to say you know well we'll all be happier if only we get the economy going more and more we'll get more and more stuff getting more and more stuff isn't what makes people happy what makes people happy is more their social relationships, their family relationships, they're having a, a, a useful job where they feel they're doing something worthwhile, all of those things. So they, the, the genes certainly, I mean, I'd agree with you to the extent that the genes set us up with a kind of happiness mechanism that makes us go out and seek certain things that would then help our genes to be passed on more often, but it doesn't actually produce what we might consider to be contentment, happiness, a happy society where people get on well doesn't do that at all because the replicators don't care about us so all the time when i'm writing about this stuff i'm thinking there are four potential beneficiaries of anything that's going on genes memes individual humans and societies or groups of humans and when you look at those four things you find really weird things going on Genes have set us up in a certain way, um, but they don't necessarily make for happy societies or happy people. I mean, the society thing, if you just look at the <clears throat> happiness scales for different countries and what you find there, and you look it up, it's fascinating, you know, look up happy, happiness by country or any simple thing to Mr. Google will give you the answer. Um, you find that the most happy societies are the most, not absolutely, but very close, the, the the least religious um scandinavian countries and so on uh, and the most miserable countries are very religious indeed don't jump from correlation to cause but there's a definite connection going on there that's worth trying to understand that's sad yeah it is a very They're trapped people are trapped in religions they can't get out of and miserable poor and, and money as well i mean the most the poorest societies are also the most religious and that may not be because religion causes poverty it may be because when people are hard up miserable oppressed they turn to religion as some kind of sucker yeah the whole thing is uh, wonderfully complicated the um <clears throat> i sometimes think that happiness is not really the measure of welfare that happiness is a kind of rate of increase of welfare if things are getting better you're happy if you're extremely rich and things that you're, you're, you're losing then you're unhappy even though you've got more money than than somebody w would imagine beyond the dreams of avarice oh i can but tell you a, 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 a little snippet um my nephew is a wonderful saxophonist and he plays he gets invited on to you know russian not anymore but he did russian oligarchs yachts and but other rich people's yachts and he said from his experience of playing gigs on these yachts the bigger the yacht the more miserable the people <laughs> yes i suppose so and just looking at um another subject you you've given consideration in the past to consciousness and, um... <laughs> more than consideration absolute obsession ah what is it i mean look 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 sorry to interrupt you but i mean Oh, it's all getting dark now. Ooh. Um, but look around me. I mean, there seems to be a world here. There seems to be that I'm conscious of it. But is there actually consciousness as well as a world? Because that's the mind body problem and we don't know how to solve it. 
Well, could a machine be conscious? Um, you could argue that it, it, consciousness is a, it, it is a property of a computing machine that is able to, uh, to recognize that it is computing. That well, it is processing a, a lot of assumptions go into that. Okay, that's a lovely idea. Okay, <laughs> so here, here's your, your idea that um, it's a computing machinery, and if it knows it's computing, it's conscious. What do you mean by being conscious there when you say that? Well, I'm just saying it's the knowledge that it is that it is uh, processing information. Okay, so you can imagine this system that's processing information, as indeed my laptop is and yours too, or whatever machine you're using. Now, do you mean that if it has some kind of software in it that will say, oh, now I'm doing something, or now I'm not, you've turned it off, <laughs> or whatever, there will be some kind of experience of color, of shape, of emotion, of what comes, you know, what the mm -hmm. philosophers call qualia, but that's just, that, that takes us off into a rabbit hole. But the sensation of being me now, seeing my hands here, seeing the screen there, seeing you there, this experience, and while loads of other things are going on in this head that are not in this experience, how would that relate to a machine just saying, oh yeah, now I'm processing? Doesn't, doesn't. Well, it, if it's going on in your head, then there's a mechanism in there which is doing it. So maybe some other mechanism could do it, but, um, the, well, look, I, look, think we're, we're... I, I mean, absolutely agree that, that you know, there's a mechanism. This this thing in here, and don't forget, it's not just a brain, an isolated brain. It's a brain controlling a body, taking inputs, making predictions about what it's going to see, and all those kinds of things. Now, artificial intelligence can do that, but here's a different take on it. That the the way I think about it. Every time you come up with the sort of idea you suggested there, you can say, yeah, OK, we can see that the electrons moving around in this machine. Why would that give rise to the sensation of green or the the feeling of cold or heat or this the feelings, the what it's like? I, I should say for everybody's benefit, when I'm talking about consciousness, I'm going like most neuroscientists and philosophers now do, taking the idea that what we mean is what it's like to be. So if I say, what is it like to be these glasses? Well, they don't do anything. They don't process anything. You know, yeah. What is it like to be my laptop? Well, that's much trickier. What is it like to be a robot that's wandering around the world, taking in information and doing things even trickier? And we, in a sense, are like that. I can't solve mm -hmm. the problem for any of those things, except my thought is as follows. We are completely and utterly deluded about consciousness because we immediately fall into the mind-body problem when we think that I'm inside here, I'm looking out through my eyes, hearing through my ears, feeling with my hands, and um, there is a what it's like to be me. What it's like to be me now is this sensation of sitting here and looking. But if you really start tearing that apart, which I do in two ways. One, through the neuroscience, um, looking at the way the brain operates and the multiple parallel processing that's going on, the oodles of different things that are going on all over the place in there that don't kind of come together in some one picture for me to look at. Uh, they're just parallel processing. And the other way I look at it is through 40, 45 years of daily meditation um, and lots and lots of retreats and lots of Zen practice and so on, where you start to dismantle that whole thing. It's just not true that there's me in here looking out at the world out there. There's just a world. There's just whatever is arising. Now, that, where do you go from there? Well, I, I'm called an illusionist because I say consciousness is an illusion. The way we normally think about consciousness is an illusion. So my answer to your question, I've gone a roundabout way, but my answer to your question is, I think an artificial system will only be conscious in the way we are when it builds a representation of a self that is inside the machine looking out at the outside world. In other words, machines will be conscious like we are only when they become as deluded as we are. In a pre-scientific age, people felt that it was all due to a soul. Yeah. And, it, and, and in fact, they, they, they thought consciousness was centered on the heart until 
the analogy of the pump was uh, was applied to that. But uh, nowadays, I think most people uh, agree that it's something that's going on with all the millions of uh, neurons that are inside our brains and spinal cord and so forth. And um, but the the still there's a certain amount of belief in the in the supernatural solution. Um, do do you think that um, that the supernatural or the paranormal could have any any element of truth in it? You're very optimistic, thinking that most people. <laughs> the truth is, most people in the world believe in a soul or a spirit or an inner self and some kind of creator. And you know, so you're talking about most educated people who've who've really thought about these things. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm getting gaga again. I've forgotten what your question was. I got so carried away about the. Really, really should we give any any answer to oh, yes, thoughts yes, of yes. the supernatural or, or the paranormal? Mm, mm, well, some people and you know that um, I started out my life very much believing in, in that. Um, back in 1970. Yeah, it's that long ago. I had a very dramatic out of the body experience, which turned into a mystical experience, although I wouldn't have had names for either of those. I just thought it was astral projection and my astral body had left and gone floating off and done stuff. Now I would look back on it and see it as a standard out of body experience, which we can explain very well in terms of what's happening in the right parietal temporal junction, which is building up our body schema. And that body schema can be disrupted and you feel your body somewhere not where it is um but the mystical experience is very 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 interesting um and mystical experiences of oneness with the universe and so on um are, are surprisingly common but because i didn't know any of that i simply jumped to the conclusion that my spirit had left my body and that it was out there and that this is totally illogical but you know I was 19, I was exploring the things. I jumped to the conclusion that if my spirit could leave my body, then obviously uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, psychokinesis, ghosts, poltergeists, and you, you name it, were all true. And so my great ambition as, a, as an undergraduate was I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to somehow find a way to do a PhD and I'm going to prove to all those closed-minded scientists that they're totally wrong and that consciousness is beyond the body and all that stuff. And so I set about it and I did lots and lots of experiments on telepathy, clairvoyance and all those things I mentioned, which basically make up parapsychology. Uh, I became a, my great ambition was to become a parapsychologist, which I did. Uh, and I never found any evidence for any of them. And so you can see what a long way I've come from that belief to my thoughts now about how we build up the illusion of these things. And could, to answer your question, could there be something? Of course there could. I could be completely wrong. There are certain kinds of evidence which, should they turn up, I would go, wow, you know, I was wrong. Because I was wrong in the first place, changing my mind from being a total believer in all that stuff. You know, I was the hippie one who read everyone's tarot cards and all that, you know. Um, I changed my mind. It was painful, difficult, but, you know, better to throw out bad ideas. Um, and I would do so again, but that kind of evidence would have to be pretty good. And it just conflicts with everything we know about the self. The more the neuroscience progresses, the more we can understand the self as a construction the brain makes for useful purposes to keep things organized. The idea that there's a me in here looking out through my eyes and so on gets you around in the world. Um, this isn't always very a good idea and meditation can dismantle it and you can live in a very different way without that illusion but i think that's what's happening now so the answer is yes i can imagine types of evidence that would make me change my mind and go back to those previous beliefs but i think it doesn't fit with neuroscience it doesn't fit with the products of personal investigation and meditation and i think it's really 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 unlikely we'll wait and yeah. see <clears throat> yeah so certainly uh, i've been fascinated by by tales of the paranormal but i have never I haven't done, done methodical investigations like you, but I can say I have never seen any convincing evidence of it. Do you ever have a dream of like somebody you really care about has died or something like that? Um, do you ever get such dreams and wake up? Oh, yes. I, I wonder I, if they have. Occasionally, um, 
people who've died who, who were close to me appear in dreams, but I'm sure that's just my mind um, reconstructing them. No, I, I mean the prediction, because this is a, a common claim that people make, that they have a dream about somebody and then uh, they wake up in the morning and read the newspaper or get the phone call or whatever to say that person died. And this is very, very, very powerful. But there was a calculation done back in the 1990s um, about how many people dream of somebody um, dying and that person dies within uh, 12 hours of 24 hours of that dream. And the calculation shows that that is going to happen sometime in Britain um, 70 times a year, something like that. Now, if you are one of those people, you're going to be convinced, aren't you? I mean, or at least you may very easily be convinced because you dreamt about that person, you thought they were alive and well, and the next morning you dreamt they were dead, and then the next morning they are. You are going to be really, really convinced. And this is the way a lot of these things work is by um, extraordinary coincidences, which with 65 million people in the country, there will be quite often happening. Yes, if, if there are enough uh, cases, then, then the coincidence will happen in, in some of them. I found myself one night there. I actually wrote this down because I think if you don't write these things down, there's no evidence that you really dreamt it. And there's an interesting phenomenon, which I expect you've experienced, where you have be wandering along in the day and something happens and you think, oh, of course, I dreamt about that. Now, the simple fact is your dreams will be have been so many dreams because an awful lot goes on in, in, in dream life. And we only remember some people remember nothing. But even those of us who remember quite a lot, you don't remember everything. And something can trigger that that memory and that can sort of interfere with with your your predictions. So mm -hmm. you need to write down if you have a dream when you think somebody's died, you have to write it down. I've only done that twice ever. Once was, um, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, when I dreamt that uh, Eric Dingle, Dingwall, had, the great psychical researcher, had died and he was fine the next day. And then quite recently, a few months ago, I just suddenly found myself, this is pathetic, I know, it's really pathetic. I found myself singing the national anthem for no reason at all. I, you know, God save our grace. Was great. And I thought, maybe the Queen's died. And I wrote it down. Well, she hadn't. She's still alive. <laughs> so at least I'm accumulating some negative evidence. Um, and I wish that more people who really thought they were having premonitions would always write them down. Um, and then then we'd have some evidence. There have been these wonderful um, premonitions bureaus long before the Internet, um, where people set up a scheme where you would write in if you've predicted a plane crash or, you know, something that somebody died, whatever it might be. And they collected these up which is a perfectly, you know, really sound way of doing it, collect them all up and then, you know, calculate how many train crashes and whatever. And all the, all the times it's been done, the averages work out. It, there's, there's no, no, people don't dream more of a terrible plane crash the, the, in the day or week before that terrible plane crash happens. It's just not so. So, you know, it would take a lot to convince me the other way, but it's possible. Yes, I think religious people also depend sometimes on coincidences and interpret yeah. them as uh, something like that. Well, <clears throat> we've, we've talked for about three quarters of an hour. Maybe we should, oh. uh, maybe we should give, uh, I could go on for a long time, but um, Me too. maybe we should give the audience a chance to participate. So can I hand back to Andreas if he can hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, I just need to let people to unmute themselves and to show their video. So that will be helpful. So I've just given everybody permission online to do that. I'll start my video as well. And uh, people. Hi, can Martin Sperling. I can see you. I can see some people I know. Hello. Mm. That's good. Let me just unclick this as well. So people are now appearing, which is great. That's fantastic. So we now come to the Q&A session. Uh, but before we do, I think it would be very apt to give both Susan and Don a big round of applause. <clears throat> well, shall we say Susan? <laughs> I was only asking oh, you. you as well. I couldn't do it without you, could I? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Unfortunately, my camera doesn't seem to be working, but you don't really want to see me anyway. I'm just going to put the lights on and we'll start with some questions in the room. I can, only, the room? I can only see about half a dozen people. Can I just say to everybody, it really helps me if I can see you, if you're asking a question. But even if you're not asking a question, it gives me an idea of 
who's there, what they're interested in. So please, if you can, turn your camera on because that will help me a lot. Okay, should we start in the room? We've heard a lot of things. We've heard from consciousness, religion, means, genes, talkings. I mean, there's so many topics. Who has got the first question in the room before we get? Huh? Where's that? Can you raise your hand? Oh, there. Good. You speak directly into the microphone. Thank you very much for the discussion, but I'd like to question this idea that means are in some way equivalent to genes. They seem to me totally different. One of the big things about genes, and indeed living things, is they have no function. The only thing they do is survive and replicate. Uh, whereas one of the arguments, you know, that we often given by anti-evolution is about the, the watchmaker. And of course, a watch is nothing like a person or, or an animal. It has a function. It's quite clear it has a function outside its head. Now, I suggest that means are rather like Someone generated them for a purpose. And they do not evolve in the way you suggest in a sort of family tree. Quite the opposite. It's more like, you know, the old, the, the family tree the other way around. With all the grandparents. All the different ideas tend to conflate. That's certainly true of religion. Religion didn't have a single starting point. It had exactly a converse. It started with lots of, and this is, this is sound anthropology, had lots of starting points, and those starting points began to coalesce into uh, organized religion. So I, I think the equivalence between genes and means is totally false. Well, I think you are totally wrong. Um, the equivalence is not that they are the same in every possible way. It's a very specific equivalence. And that is that they are both replicators. Now, one of those replicators operates in terms of chemistry and DNA, RNA transfer, protein synthesis, and the ultimate production of phenotypes, i.e. animals, plants, etc. The other replicator, memes, is in terms of information that appears in the form of processes in the brain, uh, words, um, so on, and the objects created. They are, there's no, for most memes, there's no equivalent of the genotype phenotype distinction. So that's one of the problems uh, that makes it clear why they're very different type of replicators. Yes, I agree with you to the extent that they, are, they operate completely differently. But if you accept that they're both replicators, which I think you don't, but I do. I mean, I'm only saying I think you're wrong because that's what I think. You know, I can be wrong. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to religions, I, I mean, I said that myself that they form an evolutionary tree and what that's what you're saying I and mean, we started out with all these different religions all over the world different little groups having all their different religions and certain religions have a kind of power that overtakes the uh the the simpler local religions and becomes more powerful how does it do that by exploiting the way the genes have set up our brains and our bodies and our emotions to react to things <laughs> And so the reason that, that a lot of the religions died out and the different sects appeared and competed with each other all comes down to how much they're able to exploit our proclivities, the things we like, the things we don't like, and so on. So I'm surprised from what you said that you don't, you can't, you don't want to think of memes as replicators, but I think it's a really helpful way of looking at it. Okay, because some controversy with memes and genes already. This, this is good. Keep on going. Here's another question. Uh, I, I'm finding it very hard to hear. The, the, it's as though somebody's it's too loud or they're too close to the microphone or something. It's yes, very, it, I couldn't hear what you said then at all. I find it quite hard to hear too, but uh, my ears are bad <laughs> to start with. So, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, but it's very woolly. Not like it was. Okay. Oh, is it Andrea speaking? I don't know. Well, I'm just going to see you in a second here. Yeah. Um, it was really just a point about the previous question, um, which I thought was a very interesting question. But your comment that um, means coalesce, which I agree with, I think it applies to the biological world. If you look at our DNA and our bodies, um, there's evidence of viruses in there that things like mitochondria also appear to have crossed over from the animal world or crosses over into our bodies. Um, you know, the eukaryotic cell itself was potentially two different organisms coalesce. So I think that it's easy to feel like means coalesce in a way that genes don't, but it's because we're looking at much of the time, time space. 
I'm afraid I really couldn't, I couldn't hear that. It was too bleary. Could anyone else hear it? Well, I tell you what, why don't you come to the front to the laptop and ask the question again? Oh, yes, please. Oh, that would be great. Yes. That would work, okay. yes. Yes, I, I completely lost the last contribution as well. Okay, we'll make your contribution. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's great. Yes, try again. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming that you heard the first question clearly. Not um, very clearly, but I sort of got, I hope I got the gist. Maybe I didn't. Anyway, go on. I'm just making an observation, really, which is that the previous questioner, um, although I found his point very interesting, um, he mentioned that he felt that memes are different to genes in the way they coalesce and interact in that way. And my point is that if you look at the biological world, if you look within our bodies at the DNA, there's evidence of different uh, organisms potentially contributing viruses or the mitochondria. Um, the eukaryotic cell was they think uh, two different organisms that came together. So my point really was just that it may be that memes coalesce in a way that genes also do in some ways, but we're looking at much different periods of time. And therefore there's an illusion in a sense that they're, they're quite distinct. That's, that's very good. Oh, I'm very glad you came up there to speak because I can, I could hear it now. Yes. Th this, this co co coalescing uh, business, I, I think it is, obviously they're totally different in the machinery that is copying them no question the only fundamental similarities they're both replicators and and this coalescing well let's think of the concept of a meme plex um now you have a gene plex or you have co, co adaptive gene complexes where certain genes producing certain effects in the phenotypes will always go together like classic examples are you know, if you eat meat, then you need a certain kind of intestines and, and vice versa and so on. Um, memeplex, the idea of a memeplex is like a co-adaptive complex of memes. And the same thing happens in the sense that the a memeplex will form whenever a certain, any kind of meme gets on better along with all the others in the group than on its own. And this can apply to all sorts of things, but religions are a very obvious example. So who would believe the idea that somebody 2000 years ago, some woman uh, had a vision and then gave birth without um, any father? You know, it's ridiculous. But when you discover, when you, that goes together with all the other memes of Christianity, then it begins to have a certain power and those hang together. And it's very interesting to see how the coalition breaks down. So you've got uh, in certain religious groups, uh, they stick very, very hard to the traditions and in Islam, particularly in various versions at the moment is absolutely stamping on. If you take the Taliban, any kind of dissent, any kind of what uh, David Deutsch would call um, not um, anti-rational memes, the, the kind of memes that keep something absolutely the same all the time. And there's no, no questioning, no curiosity, um, you know, stopping women going to university or going to school, even not even able, able to read is the kind of thing that happens. Um, that ha that stronghold has to carry on because the whole thing will only work when it stays together. And then you look by comparison at the Church of England, which is kind of losing people all the time because it's been nice enough to go, yeah, well, we don't really believe there was a virgin birth, but you know, it's a nice story. And we don't really believe that, you know, there is tenets of Christianity. I, I know a, a vicar who, who really doesn't believe those things and there are plenty such. Um, so this is the kind of way that the, the coalescing works and, and falls apart. I, I don't know whether that answers your, your point, but, but thank, you for, thank you for those thoughts. Okay, Susan, I'm trying to play around with the volume. Can you hear me now? That's just a blurry noise. Just a blurry noise. Okay, so I think what we need to do is, if you ask a question in the room, I should try to paraphrase it for Susan on the computer. <coughs> Does anybody else have a question in the room before we go online? No? Well, you've got smart here, so I should, I should go to the online and uh, see whether we've got any questions there. So please unmute yourselves on the online. Uh, I can see some faces. Does anybody have a question face to face before I go into the chat room? No? Nobody's got a question. Let me just go to the chat room and see what we've got there. Okay. Let's go to chat. 
Okay, so in the chat room, we've got some various questions. So let's have a look. I think you can see that as well. Um, are different memes passed on by biology than those developed by trends? Is one question. Are different memes passed on biology than those developed by trends? Uh, no, no memes are passed on biology. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what that means. I, memes are passed on by human activity, which might be a behavior. You know, I could go um, copy this and, and you could do it. That would be a very pathetic meme. Um, but normally we, we tell a story and somebody repeats the story. Um, that's a meme. But is that passed on biology? Well, it's kind of passed on because I'm a biological creature, but I I don't really know what that means. Um, and those developed by trends? Well, trends are uh, streams of memes that keep evolving because people pick up on something and they pick up on some game they want to play and lots of other people then join them or the trends to um, wear certain things. Oh, the trend to have a stupid colored hair, you know. Um, no one seems to copy that one, but you know, never mind. It's not a very successful trend. But I'm afraid I don't really understand the question because I don't think memes are passed on by biology. Okay, I've got another question from John. Is language the greatest invention resulting from a combination of powerful meme and chance genetic change? Yes, yes, I think so. Um, Dan Dennett makes the point and a lot of people object to memetics because they say, well, how do we know memes exist? Well, duh. The, the point about memetics is not to kind of say there's this new thing called a meme. It's to say, let's look at the world of human culture and uh, interchanges between humans as being based on information that's copied, varied and selected. That's the idea of it. Um, and one of the things I really like about Dan's work on it is to say, he says, you know, if you're worried about whether memes exist, well, words exist. If you have a word like, um, oh, think of a good word, uh, combination. Sorry, I just looked at your question on the chat. Combination. What about that word? Now, I could say combination. It's written there in English, you know, in printing in a certain font in the chat room. Um, it can be um, passed on verbally, it can be passed on by writing, it can be passed on by printing, um, it can be passed on by singing. Um, is there still a word? Do we say there's such a word as combination? Well, we'd say all those things are the word, because we know as human beings with the way we've thought about it, that that's the same word. So of course, memes exist. The question is, is it useful to look at language and words as being based on a new replicator? That's the big question. And Personally, I think the answer is yes, but that's what I'm working on. And I could be proved wrong that this is, I mean, the only way I can be proved wrong is that it's a completely pointless way of thinking things and it doesn't get us anywhere. Uh, if that proves to be the case before I die, that it hasn't got anywhere, okay, I go, right, that wasn't a great idea. But for the moment, I think I agree with you. Yes, language is the greatest invention. And that <laughs> has what has made human um, culture as it is now possible. Without that, we wouldn't be where we are now with all the pros and cons. Okay, thank you very much. We've got a question from Nathan. I'm going to paraphrase the first bit and then maybe it turns into two questions. And Nathan says, I really enjoyed your book and I find the idea of a meme compelling, but you mentioned that it's not had much uptake. Why is that? I think there are many, many reasons. A rather sad reason is that people don't get it. Um, you have to get the idea, as well, going back to the passport of the very first story I told, you know, um, you have to get the idea that if there's any kind of information that's copied, varied, selected, copied, very selected again and again, uh, something amazing will appear, something useful in the environment in which that happens. If you get that, um, fine, but a lot of people don't. The next problem is that people who do get it say, well, yeah, but that doesn't apply to memes. It only applies to genes. And you're just, um, you're, uh, you, you're doing harm to biology. See, there are a lot of biologists who want to have uh, evolutionary theory confined to genetics and the kind of things that we understand from there and, and object to the basic principle being applied to something else. I think that's a shame. 
but I understand why. Then there are kind of people in sociology and, and various humanities who really hate the idea of evolution at all and don't want that to apply to all the things that they think are, you know, theirs, literature and history and so on. To that, I would say, well, I'm not trying to overthrow history or, or, or linguistics or, or uh, any of the humanities at all, just to give a different way of looking, which is more kind of bottom up way, taking it down to the replicators and then going, all that comes from there. It doesn't at all take away the power and importance of, uh, of literary studies and history and all of, all of that. Um, and then there's another reason which people are terrified. Because if you really think about, I mean, I find it thrilling and wonderfully exciting to think this way, but I can totally understand why people find terrified. Because it kind of means, well, it's all just happening because it has to happen that way. Everything is happening because of what happened before. It's all a it's not like a predestination, but it's it's a mechanical process that it, the way I am speaking now is because <clears throat> of the memes that I've picked up in my lifetime, my good fortune to go to a, a ghastly school, but it <laughs> educated me and, and to go to university and to learn all these things, to live in a country where I'm free to say things like I've said this evening and if they're wrong, okay. Um, so all of that just happens. There's no free will. I, it, it threatens free, free will. The, the view of memetics no doubt threatens free will. It doesn't kind of abolish it, but it threatens it. And a lot of people find that utterly terrifying and they just don't want to go with it. Okay, fine. I have persuaded myself, probably because of the memes I've picked up, this thing here has picked up over the years, that free will is an illusion. And if it's an illusion, then it's an interesting question how you live knowing that there's not a little me and his to making the decisions. It's just a multiple parallel processing brain that's making the decisions. And then this thing here has to take the consequences. So those are just some of the reasons um, that, um, that people don't like memetics. Now I can see in the chat room, this also, Nathan says, do you feel there are lots of policy decisions or scientific research that would benefit from a memetic view, but the meme of memetics just hasn't reached them? Or is it possible that whilst it's a compelling theory, it just doesn't have many concrete applications? Brilliant question, Nathan. And I don't know the answer. Yes, I think there are lots of policy decisions or scientific risks that could benefit, but uh, there aren't been many, very many around and I'm waiting. If you think about Darwin, um, 1859, origin of species it was a very long time till the 1930s before we, the, 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 the co combination of um, uh, evolutionary theory with genetics that it all began to make sense and uh, we haven't had that happen with memetics maybe we never will but I hope we do um, but I can give you just one example of some wonderful research um, there's so little research going on about this but um, two um, Dutch and Belgian researchers um, looked into, they're basically historians, but they looked into the uh, medieval witch trials and they discovered that, well, many people had discovered this much, that the witch trials were pretty ghastly things, <laughs> but they systematically did the research that showed that, you remember the four things I said, genes, memes, individual people and groups of people, they went through those and they showed that the witch trials did not benefit anything at all other than the witch trial memes themselves and all their cruelty and you know misery that they they caused to the cut the groups that, that they happened in the, the the towns that they happened in were devastated after the the inquisitions went through uh the genes you know people were killed so their genes didn't benefit um the happiness absolutely didn't benefit it was an example of a viral meme that caused huge harm I hope there'll be a lot more research of that kind that shows that the memetic explanation is better than any other explanation we have, but we're a long way from that being general at the moment. Okay, thank you for that, Susan. I think you, the comment on, on free will could spawn a whole other set of questions uh, <laughs> here and in, in the room. But uh, I'm seeing Duncan has raised his hand and he's been very patient. So over to you, Duncan. I always am, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just sort of picking up on the point about why people haven't um, picked up the theory of memes and run with it. And I was wondering if, um, in order to be a useful theory in science, 
it's got to um, be able to predict things. I mean, this is obvious in, in physics, isn't it? I mean, you know, Arthur Eddington went and uh, looked at, uh, took an astronomical observation, and mm. um, if um, the observation hadn't been as he predicted, then the uh, theory of relativity would be wrong. Um, we're talking about uh, mimetic expan um, explanations being used by historians, but of course that's looking backwards um, at things that have already happened. But um, I'm wondering if um, your theory could actually um, predict things um, and say this is going to happen, and if it, that sort of thing doesn't happen, then your theory would be wrong. Yeah, it's a very good point. I don't think you have to rule out post-diction. I mean, there's plenty of post-diction going on in science. What you need to do is say what I think we'll find if we dig up this fossil. Mm, or yes, what we think okay. of it. And then as long as you didn't know that and you said yeah. it's kind of a prediction, but it's post-diction, uh, I think we'll find out. And of course, there's been masses of research of that kind that has helped us understand human origins going back through bones and, and, and fossils and all sorts of uh, artifacts. Um, that is certainly a, applies to memetics. Could uh, there are two two questions implicit? What you said: one, could we make predictions that come true? And um, second, can we? Is it a falsifiable theory? Is it a falsifiable theory? Mm, in only in and it's tricky. This so it's a very good question. Only in the same sense as evolutionary theory in general is uh, falsifiable. So it's often said that you can falsify Darwin's. Um, version of, of natural selection and so on if you found i don't know a bird with fur in some you know place where it couldn't possibly you know fur and feathers were diverged a long time before and then suddenly there's one with both uh, those sorts of things so in mimetic terms if you found um uh, a, a word from some language that had appeared in another language when there couldn't possibly have been any connection between them and it was complicated enough that it couldn't have arisen by chance that's the sort of thing that might falsify it so i think i think it is falsifiable with difficulty but it, in principle it's definitely falsifiable uh, if it weren't then i wouldn't i wouldn't be interested in it but as for the, the can it be useful well that you know i gave that example of of, of the witch trials and there's so little of that kind, but that's what we need. We need examples where we can see that the memes are the beneficiaries and human happiness and indeed have um, lost out because of the memes. Or we can take examples of why certain memes succeed and others don't and make predictions about the kinds of people, the kinds of psychology they have or the kinds of prior memes they've already got installed in them and make predictions about which way they might then vote or which religion they might join or which you know job they might take up because of that there are there are predictions of that kind that we could make but frankly there's only about half a dozen people in the world who think that memetics is worth pursuing so and i i'm afraid to say at my age i'm no longer really up for doing the hard graft of the research sorry but you know i did an <laughs> awful lot a long time ago and in my 70s, I'm like, OK, I'm happy writing books and talking to you wonderful people and enjoying the arguments. But I'm not anymore going to go out there and do the hard graft. There are a few people doing it and I really hope they'll do more. One thing I'm not so familiar with, um, partly being old, is, um, you know, the mo modern trends in uh, online trends. Uh, amazing. I get amazing emails, one today from someone who's invented this online game, which is some kind of weird magical thing. And, you know, I, I am not into all of that, but I think there is um, more research now going on internet memes and why certain ones spread and why certain don't and how you can manipulate them. Those are the kind of things which I think may give rise to a better understanding of memetics and what it can do. Okay, there's another question about what influenced you. So other than those of Richard Dawkins, are there any other books that you could share with us which have had a fundamental impact on the way you see the world? Oh, well, we're really uh, going off in other directions in that, in that way. Um, I recently read a book uh, by Caleb Schaaf called um, The Ascent of Information. And I love that book. There's a lot of it that I find really hard. I'm really struggling with an, the nature of information and the relationship between information and entropy. And I'm having a lot of fun reading around those problems which are bugging me. But that kind of relates to memetics because both 
selfish genes and selfish memes are basically information and i'm enjoying trying to understand the world you know looking around at the environment i'm in now as it's all information that has succeeded in getting itself copied to be here at this moment now um and other lots of other information can't be um going back through that would be kevin kelly david deutsch those kinds of people talking about the nature of the universe and the nature of information um some of you may knew, know that i'm not only interested in memes but in the possibility of a third replicator and that would be the idea that we just as biology accidentally created human beings capable of imitation which set off memes so we humans have inadvertently created machinery that can set off another replicator we thought we were constructing um all the computers and servers and phones and everything like that for our own amusement our own research our own whatever reason that we thought for ourselves but in fact what we've done is let loose the machinery that is capable of copying digital memes you might prefer to call them i call them teams or teams um but digital memes will do um which are the machinery now is capable of copying varying and selecting information which means there's a new replicator and that worries me because it replicators have replicator power and we do not know where that's going so i could go on a lot but those are sort of a start to the things that are really really oh no, and the whole thing of how do you live not believing in free will that that's that, that those are the most most things i think about Okay, well, we, you've certainly raised some more questions in the room here. So I'll just pass you over to Joe Wilson, who's got the next question here in Queen Square. Yeah. Hi, uh, good evening. Hello. With uh, the evolution of, well, with genes, you have a replicator and you have a, an, an error rate so that you have mutation and then evolution. So with memes, you know, they're a replicator, there, there may be an error rate, but is the error rate as fundamental for memes as it is for, for genes in terms yes. of evolution? Yes, yes, um, good point. Um, one thing to remember is that genes have been around a very, very long time and memes have only been around a million years. I mean, depends what you mean by them, but of the order of millions, not the order of billions of years. So what has happened with genes is um, you need to have variation. So going back to the evolutionary algorithm, vary, copy, select. The variation is critical. You need variation in order for the next stage to rule out lots of things and, and carry on. So you do need some variation, but if you have too much variation, then any good tricks you've come across get lost. Any good things that are helpful uh, can just get wiped out by varying. What's happened in the case of genes is there are two fundamental mechanisms for producing variation. There are probably others. Um, uh, one is mutations, which are accidental, and the other is recombination, which is one of the reasons why sex is good, because you get genes from two people. They're recombined in different ways, crossing over and so on, so on. And so you get a new, new combination. Both of those produce variation. The genetic system has phenomenally good error correction processes so that mutations most mutations are going to be bad this is applies to genes and memes and to any other replicator once something's got going and it's really well adapted to its environment most changes are going to be worse and only very few will be good um so genes are have a lot of error correction and keeping that down and then you've got recombination which um doesn't have to be corrected but produces new things most of which are rubbish but some succeed now in terms of memes They've not been around that long. The information is not very clear. It's nothing like the order of bases on a molecule. It's just a whole lot of noises coming out of people's mouths and things they do with their bodies and their arms, things that they create. Um, you know, they might create a little statue and someone likes it and makes another one or they dig out a canoe and somebody, you know, then some canoes sink and the ones that float are copied more. All of those, it's very, very messy. But I would say in the modern world, we are evolving towards, or memes are evolving towards much better error correction. They're also evolving towards the distinction between the replicator and the, the, phen the genotype and the phenotype in the case of biology, or some people would say the memotype and the phenotype. I don't quite like that, but most memes throughout the history of memes have not been like that. 
you just copy the sound, you copy the behavior, you copy the object. But nowadays, there is the distinction between um, the replicator and its product. So, for example, if I bought this keyboard here, um, that will be uh, because I chose a particular type of keyboard I wanted that worked with the system I've got. Um, and that uh, nobody copied that keyboard. What they cop what was copied in the factory was the instructions for making that keyboard. So there will be a digital uh, thing or take a car. You know, um, I, I've got this little smart car, which I absolutely love. Now, that smart car was built in a factory from instructions digitally encoded in a whole, you know, complicated system there. If, if lots of people buy more smart cars, then lots more will be made. I didn't and nobody did copy that particular example of the smart car from another one. It was it was the um, the uh, instructions for making cars in the factory that 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 was copied so that's the way that we're getting memes and and printing printing books and so on has the same effect you don't copy a book very rarely anymore it's not like scribes in the old days copying it by hand the uh the instructions for making the book are in the printer's um computer and then the books are spewed out according to how many people buy them so the whole process is becoming more similar if you like because it's bound to do that because it's more effective and the memes that do that survive better than the ones that don't I'm not okay. sure that really answers your question, but you set me off on that whole train of thought. <clears throat> Joe seems satisfied, so that's good enough for me. That's uh, good, enough for <laughs> good. Are there any more questions in the room? I think we're also running out of questions online. I mean, the one question actually is: is to what extent is there room for Lamarckian acquired, acquired characteristics in your worldview? Oh, that's a that's a kind of tricky one that comes up all the time. In fact, one of the other questions has sort of referred to this a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. Lamarck is perhaps unfair to blame it on Lamarck because yeah. lots of other people, including Darwin himself, had ideas like this. But what we call Lamarckism is the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So that would be, for example, um, well, here's a good example. You see my hand. It's not like this hand. Uh, nobody knows why it's like that, but it may be because the cord um, was wrapped around the fingers in my mum's tummy and uh, the, so the fingers couldn't grow properly. Now, my children do not have hands like that. <laughs> my children inherited the genes for making hands and for making everything else. Um, and it's an accident of, of my um, prenatal um, life uh, that I ended up this way. This applies absolutely gen generally in biology. If you, the, the old traditional, you know, the blacksmith who spends all the time, you know, gets really big arms, strong arms and all that, um, will have children with stronger arms. No, it, it doesn't happen. So people say in memetics, oh, well, but I invented this idea. And so then that's passed on. This is like Lamarckian. And there are, there are people who say the whole theory of memetics can't be true because we, intentionally design memes well hang on a minute how do we intentionally design memes when i write a book let's take the meme machine which i wrote all well, long 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 time ago now yeah you could say oh i had the ideas and i this little me inside was brilliant and and had these wonderful words and put the, the memetic way of looking at it is the memes made me do it um <laughs> now I actually, I really cross about this. When I, I sent the original manuscript to Dan Dennett and I'd written in there, you know, I, 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 little me didn't write this book. The memes wrote it through using me to write the book. And he said, take that book out. People will hate it. Take that piece out of the book. And I did because I was in awe of this great philosopher. I wish I hadn't because I would still say that now. What does it mean to write a book? It means being educated enough to have a language and the capacity and the machinery these days to do the job, which is all memetic stuff. And then all the memes that you've got in your head are going around and they're mixed up in a different way and they come out. There they are. I think it's two ways of looking at it. One, I wrote it. OK. Two, the memes used me to get it written. OK, I think. Leslie, uh, have you got a question? No. What nope, we nope, said, Leslie? Just... I heard you speaking, but I didn't hear what you I'm said. I'm laughing to myself. Pardon? She, had the, she was talking to herself. Oh. Excuse me. That's right. fine. Okay, well, let, listen, let's uh, draw things to a conclusion. Then I think we're out in the chat room. Any more questions in the room? 
No. Any more questions online? No, I think we're finished. So before we end, and I just give you an update as to what's coming next. Again, please all unmute online and uh, everybody, please give both Susan and Don a big round of applause. They're all muted, so I can't possibly hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed your questions and I've enjoyed yours, Don. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. I've greatly enjoyed it too. Thank you, Colin. I saw you clapping. And thank you, Martin and Sue, who I saw sitting there. I, I, like, I like you. You're giving shout outs here, Susan. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, right. What's coming next? We've got Nikolai Rahini in October talking to us about social instincts. Then in November, we have uh, uh, John Gray, the author of Straw Dogs, and his, oh. his, uh, his talk is going to be Why Cuts Don't Need Philosophy, based on his book, Feline Philosophy. And finally, in December, we have AC Grayling back, and he is going to talk, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing the title now, Will the World Ever Agree on Anything? So it looks like sounds like you've got some brilliant things ahead. Good for you. No, no, no yes. So I look forward to that. But obviously, Susan, once again, thank you very much for sharing all your thoughts with Don tonight. And as I always close these meetings, he's saying stay healthy, stay safe, and most importantly of all, stay sane. I see you next time. All the very best. Bye bye. <laughs>